Hey everyone, it's Sav here at Changing Hands Bookstore in Tempe, Arizona, otherwise known as the best place in the whole world. Today I'm going to be talking about my March TBR list, which is incredibly ambitious, but I'm also going to be talking about some of my uh, old favorites, all in honor of my favorite time of year, Women's History Month. So uh, feel free to click through in the video. I have separated this by uh, genre. If there's any topics or genres that you're interested in, click through and uh, find those and uh, let's get started. Okay, first up we have Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. Here's how the story goes. It's about Reese, who is a trans woman with a chronic issue of sleeping with married men, which has been happening ever since she had a messy breakup with her ex-partner Ames, who actually is formerly known as Amy, who is now detransitioned back into a male, and uh, he has reached out to her uh, after all this time and has let her know that he has actually impregnated his boss and wants to know if Reese wants to help them raise the baby. So, oh my god. <laughs> One thing I can say is I love books that are super messy that allow women to be messy and complicated creatures, and this is a book that really allows for that to happen. What I'm most interested in seeing in this book is how it starts to talk about the concepts of motherhood and family. What does the domestic novel look like when there's a trans woman at the center? That's something that is really interesting, and honestly, there's nobody that I would trust but a trans writer to talk about these issues of gender and sex and relationships in a really nuanced and complicated way. Uh, my all-time favorite Carmen Maria Machado, which you might know, I'm a big fan of her work, actually tweeted that she read this book recently and she said it was so good that she had to take a three hour nap to recover from how good it was. And so that's all I ever want from a book and that's what I'm looking for in this book. Next up we have What's Mine and Yours by Naima Coster. This is a story about a high school in North Carolina that is undergoing integration for the first time and it deals with two of the young characters, G and Noel, as they meet each other in the school play and they make some choices that uh, complicate and interlock their families for generations to come. So this is a multi-generational story about uh, integration, about uh, about race relations and trauma over the course of years. What I'm really interested in is Naima Coster talked about how what inspired her was actually the journalist, the renowned journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones and her work on This American Life. She showed some footage of a school board meeting where a white parent was protesting their child's school being integrated by black kids. And what I'm really interested to see in this read is how uh, Naima talks about these two matriarchs at the heads of both of these families that are kind of at war with each other. They're both, as far as I understand, complicated and nuanced women. And uh, I, I, I just love a story that, that talks about how our choices may affect uh, things that happen from years, for years to come. All right, next up we have Milk Fed by Melissa Broder. I just finished this this last weekend and all I can say is this book is like it is so good. It is everything I'm looking for in a book, personally. Here's the story. Rachel is a ex reformed Jew who now struggles with her relationship with her mother, uh, who really indoctrinated this uh, eating disorder in her from a young age. So now she struggles. She no longer believes um, in, in her religion that she grew up with. Then her therapist suggests that she takes a 90-day detox from her mother in order to better heal and maybe see what happens when her mother's out of her life. And she reluctantly agrees, but then she starts to notice that without her mother's influence around, she starts to live a more authentic life. Enter Miriam, who is this fat, happy, orthodox Jewish woman who she meets at a yogurt shop and instantly feels this sexual attraction to her. Uh, she represents everything that she sort of wishes in life. If you're familiar with Melissa Broder's work, she wrote The Pisces, also known as The Mermaid Sex Book. She does not shy away from sort of taboo, sexual, perverse situations where women are really allowed to kind of lean into their sexuality. This is a book all about female sexuality and it's a complicated relationship between two fully blown characters, two fully blown women, and and it's just, it's so good, it's luscious, and I, I'm gonna gush about this book for, for a long time. Next, we have Infinite Country by Patricia Ingle. This is another multi-generational story, except this one spans 20 or so years for, with one Colombian immigrant family as they start their lives in the late 1990s, which was a particularly turbulent period of Colombian history, through 9-11 and even into the beginning years of the Trump presidency. So if you like stories about immigration, about citizenship, this book is really for you, and it's written by uh, Patricia Ingle, who is actually a Colombiana writer, 
who uh, shares a similar story from her own family. So she writes from her own experience, and that's really special. I'm a huge fan of Patricia Engel. She's just a wonder. She's fantastic, and she really shines here. One thing that she talked about in some of her interviews is she says that this is a book that really examines what certain definitions mean. How do we define certain words? That's my favorite kind of book. She says that these definitions that she plays with here are citizenship and homeland and migration and always the ever elusive meaning of borders. This book is, is really special and perfect. Book buyer Michelle put it this way when she said that this is a book about a dream deferred, but ultimately it's a book about love. Okay, I'm going to jump into some poetry now. Uh, first up, let's talk about Obit by Victoria Chang. This is one of my all-time favorite poetry collections. It's so good. This is a book that Victoria Chang wrote after her mother passed away from pulmonary fibrosis in 2015. Uh, it's uh, a, the collection of poems are, uh, she wrote them as obits or obituaries, um, talking about all the different things that come with grief, all the things that die other than the person that you lost. The back of the book actually puts it perfect. When someone you love dies, everything dies. Her blue dress dies, empathy dies, friendships die. You, having survived, die. This, this book is really implosive. It's a sort of all-encompassing, a deep dive into grief. Um, if you've ever lost somebody, especially if you've ever lost a parent or parental figure in your life, then you'll understand this feeling that Victoria Chang talks about here, about how everything around you, the lights just kind of get dimmer when you lose that really special person. And so I highly recommend this if, you, if you've experienced that. Um, it's, it's really beautiful. Um, in particular, Victoria Chang kind of explores what it means to be a parent when you lose a parent. You know, to, to be in the act of parenting while also losing your parent, it's kind of a paradox. I think that's something that a lot of people can relate to. So if this resonates with you, go ahead and click the link in the description. Victoria Chang actually has a video where she reads one of her poems from this collection. She's a fantastic reader, and if she can't sell it to you, I don't know what will. All right, I'm gonna introduce you to your new favorite poet, Torin A. Greathouse. As she describes herself, Torin is a transgender cripple punk who is currently an MFA candidate at the University of Minnesota. This is one of my favorite collections. I say that about every book of poetry that I read, but this is one of the more recent ones that I read that really stuck with me. If you know anything about my personal style, what kind of poetry I seek out, what kind of books I seek out, I really like books that are that involve these like lyrical puzzles that you just kind of have to sit with and think about and turn over and over in your mind. And this is the kind of book that does that. One of my favorite poems is actually uh, called Medusa with the head of Perseus. You can actually click the link in the description to read that on poetryfoundation.com. But as you can see here, here's the cover art. This, this book really lies at the intersection of of, of what it means to be trans and also disabled and what it means to be a woman just living in a body, period. And there's no po more powerful image than this sort of like Re, like reverted image of Medusa from the Greek myth with the head of Perseus as opposed to the other way around. When you really think about it, that's that's so powerful, it's so beautiful, and that's the leading poem in this collection, and it only gets stronger from there. I highly recommend this. Uh, it's, like I said, it's about embodiment, it's about finding a home in, in, in yourself. It's really and ultimately a book about survival in a world that's really fraught with a lot of transphobia and a lot of ableism. There's a lot of people that don't want to see trans people or disabled people even alive and so this is a book about surviving and it's a book about finding a reason to love yourself even when the whole world is telling you that you shouldn't so recommend this one Okay, poetry fans, if you are a fan of Gwendolyn Brooks or Sonia Sanchez, then you might know or you might like Jasmine Manns here. She's a really prominent spoken word artist, so you might be familiar with her work there. But this is a book about the intersections of race and feminism, and as it says here, a love letter to the wandering black girl and a vital companion to any woman on a journey to find truth, belonging, and healing. So what better way to celebrate Women's History Month? I feel like this is a gift to all of us here this month. It's it's great. I flipped through it a little bit. I've read about half of the poems. I haven't finished it, but I'm really, really excited to go ahead and finish and see how Jasmine wraps this up. She's just a really illuminating poet, and she's fantastic on camera. You should click the link below. You can see her genius in action. She has a poem that she wrote maybe about a decade ago now that still resonates today, and I really think it fits in with this book as well. Make sure to check that out. All right, let's move on over to memoirs. First up, we've got In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado, who, as we all know, I'm like her biggest fan. I think she's just fantastic. And this is no different. Uh, In the Dream House is a personal memoir where she talks about her uh, past abusive relationship that she had with uh, with another woman. It's really nuanced. It's it's so thrilling and suspenseful. I shouldn't say thrilling, because it's it's not thrilling in like a roller coaster kind of way. It's thrilling in the kind of way where you're not sure if you're going to wake up 
up and be hurt or not. It's a story that resonates with a lot of women, as well as uh, adds this queer lens to it that oftentimes doesn't get represented in the media. And that's something that this book discusses, that very thing, which is that sometimes queer relationships, there are queer people that are abusive, just like there are straight people that are abusive. Unfortunately, for the victims in the situations, they don't always get to have any sort of representation in the media that helps illuminate uh, their situation to them. So they, they, they sometimes are stuck in situations that hurt them. This book is just a literary tour de force where Carmen Maria Machado goes across multiple layers of craft and multiple chapters that just are very style and, and syntax and, and it's it's gorgeous. It's, it's really great. It's part memoir, part thriller. Make sure to check it out. Carmen Maria Machado, my favorite of all time. All right, next up we have Dog Flowers by Danielle Geller. I'm going to read the inside flap to you about what this story is about. When Danielle Geller's mother dies of alcohol withdrawal during an attempt to get sober, Geller returns to Florida and finds her mother's life packed into eight suitcases. Most are filled with clothes, except the last one, which contains diaries, photos, and letters, a few undeveloped disposable cameras, dried sage, jewelry, and the bandana her mother wore on days she skipped a hair wash. Geller, an archivist and a writer, uses these pieces of her mother's life to try to understand her mother's relationship to home and their shared need to leave it. Geller embarks on a journey to confront her family's history and the decisions she herself was forced to make while growing up, a journey that will end at her mother's home, the Navajo Reservation. I'm extra excited to read this one because Danielle Geller is actually an MFA alum from the University of Arizona, so she's a local favorite, which she doesn't technically live here, but she's a local favorite. I've flipped through the, this book a little bit. It has lots of the pictures that are referenced here. It's it's the perfect mix of memoir and archives, so if you really like those kinds of memoirs that have lots of like evidence to go with it, it shows you the pictures, it shows you the people's lives and how they live, as well as this uh, flowing prose that reads kind of like a novel, then this is the book for you. It's, it's it deals with a lot of survival, survival's guilt, and I'm really interested to see how Danielle Geller just talks about her own experience as a child who lost a parent, especially as it is as it plays with uh, being a child and outliving your parent. Highly recommend it. Next up, we have Speak Okinawa by Elizabeth Miki. Rina. This book is about her experience with her parents, where her mother was actually a nightclub hostess in Okinawa when her dad, who was a Vietnam War vet, found her and they fell in love and immigrated or came back to America and had Elizabeth, who now is having a sort of racial identity crisis in the middle of uh, American suburbia. I really love books that talk about what it means to be an American, and this is one of those really classic immigration stories and race stories where, unfortunately, um, when you're a mixed child, it's hard to find where you are in between all of the different messages you get in America. It's really hard to find yourself in white suburbia. But what I really love about this book that makes it special is it also talks about um, U.S. occupation of other places around the world. So what does it mean to be an American, not only when you live here in America, but if, uh, you know, your father was part of an occupied part of the world and then met your mother. And this is a really, as far as I can tell, it's a fantastic look at two different parents and is one of those classic stories where where when you grow up and you become an adult, you look at your parents in a totally new light than you did when you were a child. And this is um, a book about forgiveness and learning to love yourself and learning to love the people that raised you, even if they were imperfect. Okay, next up we have Surviving the White Gaze by Rebecca Carroll. You might be familiar with uh, prominent black culture critic Rebecca Carroll from her uh, podcast called Come Through with Rebecca Carroll where she talks about race relations in America. This is a personal memoir about what it was like to be a black child that grew up in her adoptive white family and what it meant to sort of forge her own legacy and find herself as a black woman in a world that really tried to erase that from her identity. And although it was well-intentioned by the people around her, there was still aspects of her of her whole identity that were totally erased and this that going through life without even really knowing your roots or your own place in the world and yet being treated the same way as other black Americans. I think it's a particularly riveting read and it talks about this concept of the white gaze. The white gaze is really important to think about just like how we think about concepts of the male gaze because often uh, we're blind to it as a society. It's this concept as Carol describes here as uh, one where anything that is uh, known as blackness or anything that other than whiteness is totally unseen by the white eye because it's just nobody choose people just choose not to see it and she really goes into deep depth about that concept here 
All right, let's talk about some romance novels. Um, first, we've got Honey Girl by Morgan Rogers. Let me just read the back here for you. With her newly completed PhD in astronomy in hand, Grace Porter goes on a girl's trip to Vegas to celebrate. She's a straight-A, hard-working, high achiever, and she is not the kind of person who goes to Vegas and gets drunkenly married to a woman whose name she doesn't know, until she does exactly that. So this is a classic romance novel uh, uh, plot where, oh man, I got drunk with this hot person and I woke up in bed next to them and I don't even know who they are but now we're married. Um, that's kind of my dream scenario uh, to be honest but this book is, uh, uh, I'm really excited to jump into this one. Um, I love romance novels and I love how uh, diverse and queer romance novels have become over the last few years. This is no exception. It's as far as I've heard, it's fun, it's sexy, it's romantic and you can't go wrong with a feel-good story like this. Next we have the latest installment in the Brown Sister series from beloved Talia Hibbert. This is Act Your Age, Eve Brown. I'm gonna read the back to you for this one as well. Eve Brown is a certified hot mess. No matter how hard she strives to do right, her life always goes horribly wrong. So she's given up trying, but her personal brand of chaos ruins an expensive wedding. Someone had to liberate those poor doves and her parents draw the line. It's time for Eve to grow up and prove herself, even though she's not entirely sure how. Jacob Wayne is in control. Always. The bed and breakfast owner is on a mission to dominate the hospitality industry, and he expects nothing less than perfection. So when a purple-haired tornado of a woman turns up out of the blue to interview for his open chef position, he tells her the brutal truth. Not a chance in hell. Then she hits him with her car. Supposedly by accident. Yeah, right. Um, this is a classic enemies to lovers story, which uh, I personally can't get enough of. Um, and Talia Hibbert has just done such a fantastic job with her first two Brown Sisters series. It's a beloved series among romance uh, readers for the fact that it's diverse. It showcases voices and, and, and folks, people, bodies, races that you wouldn't see in romance novels otherwise. So this is a great conclusion to that series. Finally, Eve Brown, the youngest sister, gets her own story. All right, let's dive into some horror real quick. Here we have Where the Wild Ladies Are by Aoko Matsu. This book is a series of ghost stories based on Japanese folklore, all told from the perspective of dead women, so it has a feminist take on it. Here's what Michelle, our book buyer Michelle, had to say. This is not your traditional horror novel. While monsters and myth and shape-shifting figures are abound, it's subversive supernatural fiction at its finest. From a child prodigy who can shape-shift into a fox, to a woman who's haunted by her great aunt after a visit from a hair removal clinic, only to have her body grow thick, dense hair all over, and the man who's haunted by the disembodied voice of his dead mother. This book is sinister, dark, and bizarrely comic. Every story takes an unexpected left turn. Where the Wild Ladies Are is a true gem. As always, we can rely on Michelle for uh, just explaining and, and pitching books to us that we can't help but want to read. It's been on my list since October. I'm really excited to dive in. I love um, modern takes on traditional uh, stories and folk tales, and I think that this will not disappoint. All right, let's look at some nonfiction books about uh, the women experience. First up, we have Loud Black Girls, which is edited by Yome Adagoke and Elizabeth Yuvabadene. This is an anthology of black British female writers about you know what comes next in this post-Brexit, post-Donald Trump world, especially if you are a black woman. So it definitely has this British perspective, though it crosses national lines. If you're an American, you can. this will definitely still ring true for you. What I love is that it um, promotes, uh, obviously, 20 different black women writers, and they all talk about their own experiences, various nuanced experiences, what it means to be a black British woman. And the best part about it is that actually each essay has different references. So if you ever want to do your own research going forward, you can do that. You can reference the things that they reference in their essays, but it doesn't read like academic essays. It doesn't read like that at all. It reads like listening to some friends talk about their lives, in addition to having some very real references and academic thought and theory that go behind it. All right, next up we have The Body Is Not an Apology by Sonia Renee Taylor. This is a much beloved book by women all over the world, but this is the newest uh, revised paperback that just came out. What I love about this particular version is it actually has an introduction by Ijoma Alu who actually wrote the book Mediocre on the legacy of mediocre white men in America. So I trust her opinion on 
uh, introducing this beloved book. It talks about the concept of radical self-love and why is self-love radical? You know, you think of radical and you think of anti-establishment and, you know, sticking it to the man. And if you think about it, in this world, there's a lot of people who profit literally off of women hating themselves. And so to commit to an act of self-love is a really radical concept and you actively are being anti-establishment and you actively are fighting against the man. This is a really passionate and accessible book and the workbook for this is actually coming out very soon. So you can buy both of these books and use them together. It's cheaper than therapy, uh, though it's, therapy is also good. But um, I highly recommend this one. All right, next up, we have Come As You Are by Emily Nagoski, who is a sex therapist who wrote a book about why women sometimes struggle in connecting with their own sexuality. Uh, the back of the book says that it comes down, it basically is broken down into three different things. There's three things that you can do to help yourself in sexual situations. It's turning on the ons and turning off the offs, taking control of the context, and responsive desire. So this is a book that is all encompassing about how to feel more at home in your body. I think it'd be a perfect companion to Your Body is Not an Apology. It's basically just a mini seminar on how to feel most at home and comfortable in sexual situations and how to communicate that with your partner so that you're able to be your most authentic and happy self. All right, next up we have Big Friendship by Aminatou So and Anne Friedman. You might know them from their podcast, Call Your Girlfriend, which is a long distance female friendship podcast where they just kind of discuss life together. This book is about their friendship, which has spanned many years now. And they really talk about the ups and downs of their relationship where, uh, you know, sometimes they felt incredibly close to each other. Sometimes they felt very far away, often literally because most of their relationship has been long distance. But this is really a primer for how to engage in better female friendships in your life. As we know, female friendships make the world go around. I have a fantastic group of friends who I've had for years. Shout out to my laid squad. This book has really helped me uh, cultivate those kinds of relationships with my life and uh, make sure that some that distance doesn't stand in the way of fulfilling relationships, especially between women. Finally, we have a super recent release, The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space Time, and Dreams Deferred by Chanda Prescott Weinstein. I'm so excited. I cannot explain how excited I am to read this book. Um, I'm a big fan of space and the concepts of space, but what makes this really special is actually uh, Chanda is an assistant professor of physics as well as black feminist thought. So this is kind of part memoir, part physics book. It's a really good introduction into sort of like easy uh, physics thought, but it really ties in philosophy and what it means to be a black person in, in this universe. But those kinds of concepts are really explored here. I just think it's so beautiful. It comes with these great, um, you know, with pictures of space and, uh, you know, diagrams about, um, about space and concepts of physics and also always tying it back to the black experience. And actually Chanda is one of only, at the time that she researched this, it was maybe she was one of only 50 black female physicists with their PhD. And so the fact that she wrote this book for future generations to, to see and, and see themselves in, I think is really beautiful. If you're a fan of science, if you're a fan of black women, the black experience, and you wanna learn more about how these two things are actually intrinsically aligned, then uh, this book is for you. All right, folks, thank you so much for accompanying me on this journey as I talked about some of my March TBRs as well as some of my old favorites here for Women's History Month. I really appreciate it. This whole stack here, it doesn't even get close to accompanying the whole experience of what it means to be a woman, but maybe through great books like these, we can get a little closer to the answer. Make sure, if you like content like this, make sure to subscribe to the Changing Hands channel here, where myself and other wonderful booksellers can keep recommending good books to you. And make sure to hit the notification bell so that you get notified of when we post. And as always, remember to shop indie. If you don't shop through us, make sure to support your local independent bookstore. It goes a super long way. It helps us cultivate a relationship with the literature around us and our communities so that we can keep spreading the good word, examining what it means to be a human. Thank you so much.